We'll look this morning at a lesson from 2 Kings chapter 20. But it's about 100, 120 years prior to the time period that we're looking at in Bible class, the time of uh, Josiah and uh, Zephaniah, Jeremiah the prophet, and Ezekiel, back to the time of Isaiah. And some of this uh, material <clears throat> is referred to in the book of Isaiah. But in particular, uh, Second Kings gives us a really good understanding of it. A uh, really good understanding to know what we're dealing with, what, what was really happening at that time period. But the application of this historical event gives us the opportunity to look at the lesson, what have they seen in your house? Okay? So, reading the passage. At that time, Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, sung a son, I'm sorry, king of Babylon, sent envoys with letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. Hezekiah had a boil of some sort, apparently, an infection, and he was about to die. Isaiah, Isaiah had come to him, told him he was going to die. Uh, he prayed. Before Isaiah could even get out of the courtyard, the Lord told him to go back, tell him he was going to be given 15 more years of life. Okay? Because he'd been a fairly good king and had made reforms. Within that 15 year period, he's going to have a son by the name of uh, Manasseh. Ends up being a bad king. Manasseh becomes king when he's 12 years old. 15 years of life, Manasseh, his son, becomes king at 12. That tells us that he had no heir at that time. That would have been the end of that lineage. Someone else would have been king. But you see all this thing being uh, how it illuminates the historical account. But he recovers from this sickness. And Hezekiah welcomed them, these ambassadors from Babylon, and he showed them all his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oil, his armory, all that was found in his storehouses. There was nothing in his house or in all his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say, and from where did they come to you? And Hezekiah said, they came, they have come from a far country, from Babylon. He, that's Isaiah, said, what have they seen in your house? And Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing in my storehouses that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord, and some of your sons who will come from you, sons, grandsons, great-grandsons, and such, uh, who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Gives you an idea about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach and Abednego were made eunuchs when they were taken to Babylon. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord that you have spoken is good, for he thought, why not, if there will be peace and security in my days. In my days. So Hezekiah is one of the greatest kings of Judah. I told you before, he is a reformer in a time when the northern kingdom was being destroyed. Judah itself was nearly destroyed, but by the mercy of God, Jerusalem was spared because of Hezekiah's reforms at the temple and some public works that uh, Hezekiah had performed. That brought the city through a terrible siege by the Babylonians and one of the great uh, Bible proofs, Hezekiah's water tunnel. Uh, that appears in some of the BAR, Bible 
archaeological review magazines and such, they found that tunnel, you know, that, that he brought water into the city that they could survive some of these sieges. Tells you some of the good things that, that Hezekiah did. He was a great reformer, but our text reveals a critical mistake made by Hezekiah a few years later after he recovers. See, Hezekiah became ill. He would have died, but God extended his life for 15 years. The news of the recovery reaches Babylon. The ruler sent ambassadors to him. What is it? He's filled with pride, isn't it? I'm going to show off a little bit. I'm going to show these ambassadors. He leads them around Jerusalem and the temple, and he shows them all the treasures of the temple and all the treasures of the king's stores. And you know what the ambassadors are doing? Taking notes. Look at this. Look what they've got. Look what's in these treasure houses. Come on. Next slide. There we go. Then the Lord sent Isaiah to King Hezekiah with a couple questions and a prophecy. What did these men say and where are they where did they come from? Of course, you know, they're from Babylon. They come to honor him. What have they seen in your house? Look, everything, right? Behold, the days are coming when all shall be carried to Babylon. And this was fulfilled eventually, 586 BC. And I've talked about the three carryings away. 606, 596, 586 B.C. You know what Hezekiah's response is? Basically, and I read it just a moment ago, but paraphrasing it, at least I'll be dead and gone by then. <laughs> it's not going to happen in my day. You know, I don't have to worry about it. <sighs> he was a great king. But sometimes, you know, that's the attitude that we may have about some things especially things that go on. What's going to happen with our children? Oh, that's that's their problem. That's your children. What's going to happen with our grandchildren? Oh, that, they'll have to worry about it. I'll be dead and gone by then. That's that's for them to take care of. That, that They're responsible for that. Well, it leads us to a question. All of us have things in our homes that we're proud of, don't we? We get visitors. We like to show some things off what I got here. Who are we showing them off to? You know, I, I've been in some people's homes that they've got secret rooms in their homes. Now, I, I won't tell you who. I won't tell you where they are in their homes, but I've been in those secret rooms and, you know, <clears throat> there's a reason for it. Okay? But you still show them to everybody. You wouldn't. You'd be crazy to do it. But they're proud. We've got things we're proud of, and pride can get us to show them off at times. But a home is so much more than just things, isn't it? it, it, it it's more than, okay, it, it's more than a bunch of guns in a secret room and ammunition. It's it's more than gold in a, in a safe somewhere. It's... It, it's more than artwork, you know, uh, half million dollar Rembrandts hanging on a wall somewhere. A home's more than that, isn't it? Now, sometimes those things become more important than the home. So the question, it's not what have they seen in your house. What have they seen in your home. What have they seen in your house? But really, I thought I had, what have they seen in your home? But, yeah. What have they seen in your house? But I'm talking more about home. Would they see order or would they see chaos? Well, order is a direct result of proper authority, right? Have you ever seen homes where there's no proper authority? I mean, sometimes there's authority there, but it's not a proper authority. And that when there's not when there's authority, but it's not a proper authority, it still leads to chaos, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm the boss. What I say goes. Oh, yesterday you told me something totally different than that. That's okay. I changed my mind. You know, no, 
there, there needs to be some reason. Oh, why did you change your mind? I don't have to tell you. I'm just the boss, you know, that would do it this No. A direct result of proper authority. Well, some people abuse authority, don't they? And some people reject authority. And, and within a home, that, that can happen, can it? That can happen. Sometimes parents reject authority. Uh, they reject authority of the community. They reject authority of, of the nation. They, they reject authority of God. Now, God doesn't have... Who's... Who was it? Pharaoh. Think about that. Who is God to tell me what to do with my slaves? They're my slaves. I do what I want to do with them. Well, some people reject authority. Some people abuse authority. I'm the boss here, and, and, and I'm going. This is what's going to happen. And yeah, there has to be authority. But again, that authority needs to be a proper authority. Without authority, there's no foundation to build good relationships on. And that's the key, isn't it? A proper relationship will help to build proper relationships. Proper authority builds good relationships. But when the authority's wrong, whether it's abuse of authority or a rejection of authority, you can't build good relationships. There's always going to be problems. There's always going to be tensions. Listen, there are a lot of vain philosophies and there are methods for raising children, families, keeping homes together. Think about what you can get out there. Remember, uh, you know, when I was young, uh, Dr. Spock, right? Yeah. That here's how you ought to raise your kids and, and what to do. It raised a bunch of spoiled brats, didn't it? Pretty much. And there's still things going on. Think about what the media has portrayed. It used to be a show on television. Father knows best, right? Somewhere along the line it got change where the father was the dummy in the family. He didn't know nothing. You know, if the wife wasn't correcting the father and getting things right, well, the children had to do it because the, the mother was just as dumb as the father was. You know? Charles in charge. Yeah, they had to have somebody else come in to take over. Well, I guess that's the way some families run. Now, there are a lot of things that can be said about authority. There, there's proper authority. But only in the Christian home is God given proper respect. And God's what, you know, God's order. And there's not an abuse of power, but there's not our authority, and there's not a rejection of authority either. There are things working together. So somebody comes to visit, well, what do they see in your house? What do they see in your home? Would they see the proper respect for each person and role in the home? Okay, Ephesians 1, or 5.23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, he's the boss. I take it to mean he's, he's, he's the decision maker. Okay? Final decision maker. Right or wrong? Now, if he makes the wrong decision, it's all right to say, well, honey, you made the wrong decision. But, some, you know, you can't have two decision makers. It, it won't work that way. And he can't abdicate his authority. I think I said before, there are lots of times when I said, what do you want to eat? I don't care. Fix something. Okay? Because it really doesn't matter. Just If I want something special, I'll say I want something special. But, you know, I don't care. That, that's just one of those things that she can she can do. Okay? But there are some things that only the the head of the household can really make the decisions on. But but that's why he's the head of the household. Supposed to be. Now first Timothy chapter five verse fourteen. This kind of puts it in perspective too. Paul says, so I would have younger widows marry, bear children, and here's the key, manage their households and give the adversary no occasion to slander. 
So yeah, the, the husband is the head of the wife and the head of the household, but what's the wife supposed to do? Manage the household. Manage it. Okay. But well, typically in those days, the husband was out working outside of the home, so the, the wife was to manage the home. Okay, I, I think menu comes under the management of the household. But you could see how that would work together. Work together. Now, you also throw in something like Proverbs chapter 31 and think about what that woman was doing in managing her household. She even had a cottage industry going on. She had young women from the community hired to do, to do not housework, but work in the house to sell goods in the community. She was managing her household. So that takes in a, a broad area uh, to think about. Colossians 3.20 Children, obey your parents and everything, for this pleases the Lord. And there again, there's, there's where a lot of the tensions, because a lot of children reject authority, don't they? It's a natural thing, isn't it? They do. So they have to be taught authority. Ephesians 6, 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Uh, how, how do you provoke them to anger? Well, by abusing authority not teaching them authority the proper way, okay? but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's uh, some good thoughts on that. So uh, that kind of gets that, uh, that idea of, of authority and respect. When each one's fitting into their proper role, into their proper place, and they understand it, well, there's not chaos within the household. Third, would they see Bible study and prayer in the home? Well, why is that important? Hey, listen, three or four hours in the church building a week, what's that compared to 164 other hours out in the world? That's a lot of time out there, isn't it? It is. So do they see the Bible study? Do they see the Bibles opened up? Prayer. Is it there? Is it in the home? That's an important thing. Would they see good influence? Good influence. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Our works will follow us, whether they're good or bad. They're going to follow us to judgment. And you know who's going to see them first? All children? Little hypocrite leaders, right? <laughs> Dad, you said this and then you did that. Why'd you do that when you said this? <laughs> Mom? <laughs> yeah, they do it. And they understand. Sometimes they can be very good teachers for us also. Our families are the ones who are going to be influenced the most by our works because they want, uh, they're listening to us and they're watching it watching us. It may look like they're not paying attention, but I guarantee you they are. And sometime they're going to show it, and they're going to express it to us. Five, would they see hospitality? Romans 12, 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Number six, would they see good literature? Well, why is that important? Proverbs 23, 7a, and I, I put it from New King James Version because uh, American Standard Version, English Standard Version, all those kind of reads a little different. I like the way the, the King James Version, the New King James Version starts it off there. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. You can't fill 
your mind with trash and maintain a good heart. Does that make sense? Okay, man. Yeah. It's impossible. So, you know, what's going to be in our homes? What, what, what's going to be in our houses? Good literature or trash? You know, and if we're filling it up with trash, well, well, you know, we, we want it to be good. Now, is trash going to be there? Hey, you know, it comes in on the TV, it comes in in the records. They don't have records now. Yeah, we got records now. You know, records are coming back. We got the vinyls. Yeah, they call them vinyls now. They don't call them LPs, you know, anything like that. Come back. Comes in on the radio, comes in on the TV, comes in on the DVD. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's there. Comes in on the internet. It can come in, it can come in, it can come in. What do we do with it? Say, so becomes, what are we doing? Do we fill our mind with it? Can't maintain a good heart if we're filling our mind with the trash. But that becomes that, that orderly pre uh, process. You know, because that's going to lead to chaos. Chaos in our lives. That was six. Seven. Would they see wholesome entertainment? And that goes right back to it. Remember those old shows on TV and sometimes the movies and stuff? But, but, but I remember them and, and, and a lot of them, you know, those, those, those nice family shows that they had, lots of times they had well-stocked bars, right? Why? Well, because the dad was a lawyer or a doctor or a short salesman or whatever, and they're going to have company over what uh, they had to entertain people. And that's how you entertain people. And not only that, hey, the guys are coming over, get the poker chips and cards out, you know. I lost $40 last week, I'm getting it back this week. The media concept of the modern home contained that fully stocked bar, the poker table, the gambling, you know, that, that, that what? Well, that's just what you do. Is that wholesome entertainment? You know, I've seen a lot of fights over gambling. If you knew how I grew up, saw things that I saw growing up, you know where it's coming from. Okay? That ain't wholesome stuff. No way. Fits right into it here. Would they see good associates? Who are you let in your home? Who are your friends? Who are the friends you let around your children? Not that. It's kind of a crude example, not crude example, but a rough, sketchy type example here. Uh, when I was young, uh, Oh, I was about seven, eight years, seven years old. Uh, Dad, mom remodeled the house, and they had some guys come and work on the house. They were carpenters, okay? And, and one of the guys had tuberculosis. And me and my brother, every time we'd get the little deal? Did you ever get that little tuberculosis test deal where they give you that little shot under the skin? Man, we'd swell up, have to go get a chest x-ray. Never got tuberculosis, but always tested positive for it. There it was. How many women have children, divorce their husband, take up with a guy, a year or two later find out he's a child molester and he's molesting their children.
How many guys marry a, a woman who's didn't? Well, anyway, what do your children see in the people you associate with? Call your friends, your buddies, your pals. What do they see? So it's the, these are just questions that we, we need to be asking ourselves because we want those good homes, those good families. So basic premise, we see what happened with Hezekiah, what happens here? God's word and God's authority are the foundation of a Christian home. I, I believe that. I believe. Am I perfect? Absolutely not. My wife will tell you. Okay? But doesn't mean we don't strive for perfection, right? Listen. Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Is God's authority seen in your home? Or do you talk about God's authority to your children? I know most of us, our children are grown up and gone. But the lessons are still valuable. Joshua 24, 15. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you'll serve. Just don't say, I'm serving the Lord. If I'm serving, if you're serving Baal or Milcom or Malcolm or self or whoever, okay? Whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods and the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. <sighs> Sounds like a godly leader there, right? Yeah. One thing you read about <coughs> the children of Israel remained faithful to God after Joshua died as long as the elders lived who were there under Joshua's time. But once that, that generation died, you know what happened? They get off into the problems that you see in the book of Judges. <laughs> Christian home. A Christian home is a home that will influence people for generations to come. influence our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, if we're blessed like that. Listen, and, and here's the point. Look, remember in the book of Proverbs, bring up your children and the way that they should go, and when they're old, they'll not depart from it. Okay? But, but here's an answer to it, like, or, or an explanation of it. Listen to this. Luke 15, 17 through 19. The prodigal son... He's left home, wasted his money, he's eating pig food, right? But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have much, have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise, go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. But it wasn't only the food that drew him back. He remembered his father's house and how good it was back there. Why? Because it was a God-fearing house. God's authority was there. And he wanted to go back. Because he found out how terrible it was, how chaotic it was, where God wasn't in authority. Conclusion. Living in a Christian home is a privilege we can give ourselves and our children and our grandchildren. We can give it to them. The faithfulness and strength of the church in the succeeding generations depends on faithful and strong Christian homes today. What the church is going to be tomorrow may not be what the church is here today. The church here today. So what's going to be in the homes today? 
it's going to determine what the church congregations are tomorrow. I hope, I hope you get some good out of this. I See what Hezekiah had done? Again, what was Hezekiah's response? Well, at least I'll be dead and gone when that happens. Maybe you see why things didn't go so well for Israel or for Judah. Anyway, that's your lesson, my lesson, our lesson. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. If you have to leave, please let your request be made known as we stand to sing.